Wisdom of the day. Never respond to a wedding invitation with, hey, maybe next time. Thank you and welcome to the Reckless Podcast. Yeah, once again, we're back here to take away from your time and, and, and uh, all the troubles of your life. Get away from the politics and the uh, BS that your, uh, your family or wife or whoever that is the heck that's on your butt uh, is bothering you today. And talk about food and booze and anything else you can put in your mouth. We have uh, Travis Tidwell with us from Glen Morangi, which I'm learning. I probably just said it wrong again, but I'll try my hardest and art beg. And uh, he's going to be with us talking about some awesome scotches, man. Anyway, uh, thank you guys for joining us once again. Uh, if you're here on uh, YouTube or you're here uh, on SoundCloud or just uh, listening in your car, or somebody subjected you and tortured you and held you down to listen to it, you're welcome. So anyway, we're going to get to it, man. Hey, day of the Mr. Travis, how are you today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, brother. Thank you for coming out of downtown Fullerton uh, during the day, which I know not many people see it during the day, and it's beautiful sunshine and grace. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah, to not, not to too bad, right? Yeah, totally different uh, change of pace from the afternoon or in the evening. Yeah, it's a lot easier to see it when both eyes are open is what you mean to say. 100%. <laughs> so, man, I, I know we, we had talked just briefly and, uh, you know, I always like to learn about uh, people and places and things that go on. And, you know, I'm a culinary guy. And so that's why I'm always interested in booze. To me, the process is intriguing. Why people do it are intriguing. Um, how you get behind one to the thousands of kind of booze that there is in the world and not just scotch or whiskey or bourbon or even I've learned so much about vodka in the last little bit. And I don't even like this stuff, but... Uh, you know, the, the art behind what it takes for somebody to have the knowledge of one product is amazing. Yeah. All right, man. Tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and why the hell you do what you do, brother. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just growing up as a kid in a small town outside of Yosemite, I really kind of was always working in restaurants. Really, that was the only job you could have was restaurants or working in a local grocery store. So I kind of went the restaurant route. And um, from there, I was just really kind of inspired to, to, to go to culinary school and, and make a career out of it. Little did I know halfway through school probably not what I wanted to do. Um, however, I did. You learned that there's no damn money in that is what happened. Right? Yeah. We all go broke in this business. Going broke as well as all my friends. Like the only friends that I had were the people that worked in the restaurant industry. And right. all, all my other friends were, were either like out having a good time drinking in bars when I was, guess what? Working in the restaurant. So mm -hmm. um, I kind of took a job as a bar back and really just fell in love with the different flavors that were found behind the bar. Much like you said, um, you know, really all the different categories, the spirits, you know, whether it be tequila, mezcal, scotch, whiskey, bourbon, um, you know, all those different flavor profiles are so different, but they're all kind of from the same story. You know, they're all distilled spirits from some sort of raw ingredient. And it's really the people in the craftsmanship that make these flavors different. And that's really kind of how I fell in love with it and really just started pursuing that while I was in culinary school, to taking a bunch of wine classes and, and falling in love with different categories of wine as well. And then I realized I was kind of hooked yeah, you know what's you know what's crazy, man. Growing up in this business, I mean, I, I was the same way, man. I, I you know booze booze and, and liquor to me and wine and everything else at first was just to get jacked up, right? I mean, you know, you drink it, you're like, cool, that was good. It wasn't horrible. Maybe the hangover was what it was. And as you grow into these things, you realize the residual sugars and what it causes and why why those things. And as you get older, you understand that <laughs> that uh, the better the booze, the less the hangover, really. But you learn about quality and and what you want and if it pairs with food or not food or you know what experience you want and everything you drink. And, um, you know, with, with age comes knowledge, I guess, to some level, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, the first couple of times when I would go buy a bottle of something for myself for like a house party or whatever, it was, like you said, just to, just to, to catch that buzz. It wasn't really on the quality. And then as I started taking those wine classes, that was probably my biggest mistake was finding out the difference between a five to ten dollar bottle of wine and a forty dollar bottle of wine. Right, that's why you didn't want to be a chef anymore. You got to afford the forty dollar bottle of wine. That's what's up. That's right, and it doesn't last as long, you know. And <laughs> and, and that's really how I got into spirits. I, I bought a bottle of uh, single malt Scotch whiskey that came with two fancy glasses because, of course, I was a broke college student. Right. And I realized that bottle of Scotch whiskey lasted me, you know, a month versus like, hey, I opened this bottle of wine great now it's gone which is you know one or two days maybe but yeah i know myself if i open that bottle of wine it's done ski it, it's gone yeah so 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 what led you into into scotch man i mean this is scotch is i would say i mean this is my opinion i'm not i'm not a professional in liquor by any means uh i i know a lot about flavor and taste but i mean scotch to me seems like one of the more complex built out liquors there is i mean with history and everything else am i wrong yeah no you're 100 percent right um the two distilleries that we have i mean they've been making and producing whiskey for almost 200 years. one of them has been making whiskey for 200 years and the other one just celebrated our 175th year anniversary 
So it is kind of crazy. Um, for me, I guess the, the easiest way that I got into it was I started tasting some of the flavors in Scotch whiskey that I was tasting in some of those wines that I was tasting in, 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 in my wine classes. And then I kind of put the two together. I realized, hey, these whiskeys have a lot of complexities and there's a lot of subtle flavor differences, you know, like based on if it's smoky or if it's not smoky. And then you get some of these darker fruit notes versus the stone fruit flavors. And that's really kind of how I fell in love with it. And then I just started tasting more and more and, and really, you know, expanding my, my knowledge and reading about it. It became a hobby and like a passion of mine. And that's really how I kind of just got lucky into this business, you know? So, so you, you like all browns? Like all browns liquors, right? I mean, you were saying earlier you got a big, I mean, you showed me a picture of a massive bourbon collection, right? Bourbon whiskey. I'm, I'm going with brown spirits. Yeah. I mean, I tend to lean more, lean more towards brown spirits for you sure. You racist bastard. I said spirits. I said brown spirits. <laughs> um, I do also really enjoy mezcal, but I think that's probably because I really enjoy the smoky or peated whiskeys. And right. I, I think mezcal has that kind of correlation between the two. For sure. For sure. So, so what's, so, so we went into browns. Now you're going into scotch. And, um, and you just said you just got back from Scotland, right? Correct. Yeah. Talk to me about that, bro. Come on now. Um, yeah, so I just got Did back. Did they make you wear a kilt? That's really important things. Um, no. How I, dare you? Yeah, I wasn't wearing a kilt. Um, I know. it's kind That'd of. That'd be the first thing I did, dude. Drop trowel. Give me the dress, dude. I'm in. Yeah. Screw it's, you all. It's kind of sacrilege. I really should. <laughs> I should. Um, being in the motherland and everything. Um, yeah, I just got back three weeks ago. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful places I've, I've been as far as the people, the, the food, the culture. I mean, the food's not exceptional but no it, they don't know how to use salt is what i heard yeah, yeah i mean well, it yeah. depends um all right i'm just making it up i'm kidding there, there is a lot of meat and potatoes so yeah well yeah i'm uh, from texas bro it's a lot of meat and potatoes everywhere it's true we just slather it in some salty sweet stuff and call it yummy that's awesome <laughs> um so yeah going out to uh scotland just seeing some of the different you know more outer areas of Scotland, uh, going to Isla, which is where Ardbeg is from. Cool. Uh, also going up to the Highlands, which is where Glen Morangie is located. Um, and taking some of those small boats out on like the Dornick Firth and really seeing the, the marine life, uh, the water, seeing dolphins, bottlenose dolphins that are like two, two, two to 3,000 pounds, which is pretty abnormal. 3,000 pound dolphin? I think that's called a whale, bro. Yeah, it's because it's so cold. So that's they need, rad. They need, they need all that extra layer of, of blubber to, to stay warm. But... The marine biologist we were with, he was basically just saying, the the dolphins out there, all they do is is hunt and eat like twenty four seven. That's all they're doing, back and forth is 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 just looking for food the entire time. Sounds like my favorite pastime, right? Absolutely, man, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing, brother. I am looking forward to trying this. Can you can you tell me a little bit about what you brought, and then we're gonna get some glasses. And then, man, I want you to I want you to enlighten me on the wisdom and sky. Can you do it in an accent though? Is it? No, no, uh, I tried. Maybe, maybe, maybe a little bit. It, All right. It might come through, but, um, <laughs> you know, truth be told, I'm actually not Scottish. Um, so that's all right. Yeah. I'm barely American. Right. Isn't that how it works? Aren't we all that way? That's for sure. <laughs> um, so yeah, working for Glenmorangie and Ardbeg, uh, today I brought the Glenmorangie 10 year old, one of our finished whiskeys called La Santa, which is our sherry cask. I brought the classic 18 year old and then one of our really unique offerings called Glenmorangie Signet. And then uh, on, on the uh, sister distillery side, I brought uh, the Ardbeg uh, Anno, which is our newest Ardbeg expression. So, And by newest, you still mean how, how long is that age when you say newest? Um, it's about, uh, it, it's what we call a non-age statement whiskey, so there is no declared age. Oh, cool. But it is the newest to the core range being, uh, we, we just created and added this whiskey to our permanent expression range in the last uh, eight months, eight or nine months. And we hadn't been able to do that for 10 years with Ardbeg because of the, the history of Ardbeg going through some, some rough times and really having a lack of inventory when we purchased the distillery. Right, right. Well, so I heard a rumor. We talked about this on one of the other shows is that with the way whiskeys and scotches and browns are going, that it's going to be hard for a lot of distilleries to keep making a 12, 18, 21 or whatever the years may be just because it's going out faster than we can age it, right? We can't quick age a 21 year wait, it's 21 years that's how it goes is this true for you guys or um it is true for a lot of distilleries in scotland um glen Morangie, we don't really have any issues because we are one of the few distilleries that hasn't been closed we were owned by the same family for 90 years uh being the mcdonald family so we do have ample like stocks. the actual mcdonald family uh one of one of the many 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 mcdonald that's families. pretty gangster um so yeah we have plenty of stock left laid down for Glen Morangie. With Ardbeg, it's a whole different situation because Ardbeg was dormant or, or mothballed for 16 years. So we didn't really have any inventory. And then when we purchased the distillery in 97, 
Uh, we went into the warehouses and surprise, there was only about 200 casks left and they were very, very old stocks. So we had to start over. Um, so, right, so, so it may hit one, but not the other. So it, there is some truth to this statement. Yeah. Because everybody I keep asking that's in here that has Browns are like, no, never. I'm like, no, no, no. I know they're getting rid of McCallan 18. I know they're doing some other stuff. Uh, and I heard that, but I don't know for a fact, right? So if that's like a real thing or not. Yeah. It, it really comes down to the capacity and the size of your distillery and how long you've been producing. That's what she said. Right? Yeah, I had uh, to do it. It's true. Um, so some distilleries are running into some hardships, but you're also seeing kind of a trend going forward where a lot of distilleries are actually betting on the future and expanding their distilleries. Glenn Morangy and Ardbeg are both going through expansions where we're going to be able to increase our capacity. I was just fortunate to see the new McAllen distillery, and it is a monster. They're going to be able to produce 15 million liters of pure alcohol a year now, which is insane. That's we a hell of a party. Yeah, exactly. Oh, man. Exactly. So. Good. Well, that's awesome. That's best news for me because I'm a, I'm a brown liquor kind of guy as well. I know that that uh, fits in what we were saying earlier, but uh, I agree, man. I, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope everybody grows with it, and I hope it stays on track, man. I mean, you know, you never know how fads come and go, but this one seems to be sticking pretty hard. Yeah, and that and that's one of the the positive things for me being in the industry, seeing a lot of the major companies betting on the future and really investing in their facilities, the warehouses, and continuing to expand is is a good thing, because it gives us hope for the future that there will be enough whiskey and that this is a long term uh, thing. But who knows if people quit drinking whiskey, then we could all be in trouble. So well, that ain't gonna happen today. Yeah. No quitting drinking whiskey in this place today. Here we are, man. Thank you. Thank you for all that knowledge. Uh, we're going to bet on our future and get some glasses and see how the day turns out. See you guys back in a few at the Reckless Podcast.